Funding for NJ Spotlight News is provided by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. And New Jersey Realtors, the voice for real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. Good evening and thanks for joining us this Thursday night. I'm Brianna Venosi. It came down to the wire, but a railroad strike threatening to cripple U.S. supply chains has been averted. The deal was brokered early this morning after marathon talks between the federal government and the nation's two largest freight rail unions, representing more than 50,000 engineers and conductors. The tentative agreement reportedly gives union members pay raises both immediately and over the next five years, along with other work rules and scheduling changes. Changes. The consequences were so dire, reports say President Biden personally called into the negotiations around 9 o'clock last night, emphasizing the growing power of the labor movement. The president reportedly stressing the economic harm that would hit families, businesses, and communities if the rail system shut down. Every good that you need seems to end up on a rail getting delivered to where it needs to go. With unemployment still near record lows and signs of progress and lowering costs, this agreement allows us to continue to rebuild a better America with an economy that truly works for working people and their families. Today is a win, and I mean this sincerely, a win for America. The effects of the potential work stoppage would have been devastating for New Jersey and its roughly 1,000 miles of freight lines. Senior correspondent Joanna Gagas takes a deeper look inside what would have been the first national rail strike in 30 years. With the amount of pressure coming from industry on them, the amount of pressure coming uh, from the government, I think both sides knew they had to get something done. And so after 20 hours of negotiations, railroad union leaders struck a tentative deal with federal labor leaders to avoid a strike that threatened to shut down rail lines here in New Jersey and across the country. It really came down to matters of workplace scheduling. Um, if you'll recall, a few weeks back, the president had a, a special emergency board that made some recommendations around wages and salaries, which were really quite lucrative. They were still really concerned about having time off regarding um, sick time and going to medical appointments because you know rail workers are really on call around the clock and it's very difficult to to manage things like your personal health if you don't know when you need to be at work the tentative deal was reached after president biden placed a call to u.s labor secretary marty walsh urging him to get it done the details of the agreement haven't been released yet. Reports say unions will get a 24% salary increase over the next five years, but both sides are now in what's called a cooling down period. Even when the union and management come to an agreement, they have to bring that back to the union members to vote to ratify it. So it, it's really important that the, the leaders that are at the bargaining table are taking the pulse of the members. So the cooling down period helps with that. Um, and it's just, you know, cooler heads prevail. So it's always good to to step away from it for a minute, take a breath and, and think about your priorities and come back to the table. But still today, there were major sighs of relief from industries that have been bracing for the worst, like Amtrak that had already canceled many of its commuter trains that run on tracks owned by freight railroads. In a statement, the company said Amtrak is working quickly to restore canceled trains and reaching out to impacted customers to accommodate on first available departures. And Tony Russo says New Jersey's Commerce and Industry Association breathed a little easier today, knowing the supply chain wouldn't be completely disrupted. Yes, there was a big sigh of relief to see that a deal was reached, especially since we're going into the holiday season, too. Uh, and it would have been very disruptive. And a lot of companies really need a good holiday season to really rebound from a tough economy. A rail strike could have devastated the U.S. economy, according to the Association of American Railroads, that projected a rail shutdown could have cost $2 billion a day. The industries that would have been most affected... We're looking at coal. We're looking at grain. We're looking at oil. We're looking at chemicals, iron ore, 
a lot of basic materials would be coming to a standstill. And that may not impact our economy today, or at least consumers wouldn't feel it today. But down the road, if we don't have iron ore, how we build anything with iron and steel? Um, if we don't have fuel in certain parts, how, how, how do we run our economy, our, our lives? And it could lead to backlogs at the ports here in New Jersey, among other things that consumers would feel, says Ron Liebman. You couldn't ship cars out of a port. You'd see them backing up and you couldn't get the car you want. Grain, of course, processing for cereal manufacturers, anybody who utilizes um, cereal product, uh, chemicals, of a whole host of chemicals from fertilizers on to much more complex things uh, that may be used for large scale production. So it, it would have a really significant impact. And while shipping moved forward today with no disruption, Rudolf Leuschner cautions, there's no ink on any dotted line yet. We're not out of the woods by any stretch of the imagination. Yet. The key sticking points in the deal were around work flexibility. O overall, especially since uh, the pandemic started, has become a more important issue for a lot of people. As soon as that tentative agreement came uh, out, some of the members of the labor union said that they are not in support. But while the members consider the new deal during this cooling down period, they have agreed not to go on strike. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Joanna Gagas. After more than three decades of state oversight, Jersey City is regaining full control of its public school district. The State Board of Education on Wednesday approved the transfer and congratulated the school system for meeting its milestones while becoming a high-performing district. The state took over Jersey City schools in 1989 after state officials said students weren't able to get the education they deserved because the schools were plagued by cronyism and other chaos. The state appointed a superintendent to make all decisions, including hiring, rather than the school board. Since then, the city has slowly regained control of both hiring and decision-making rights. This is the third school district in New Jersey to regain local control. Newark and Patterson were taken over in the 1990s for similar reasons, but were able to come out from under state oversight in 2020 and 2021. Camden is the only district still under full state control. For the first time in a decade, the polio virus is resurfacing. It was first detected in July in a New York suburb bordering New Jersey, prompting officials to deploy wastewater testing to get a gauge on the severity of the virus's community spread. Well, now the CDC is testing all communities at highest risk for the life-threatening disease. But public health officials in New Jersey say while the tool is critical in fighting back, more emphasis needs to be put on vaccinations. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports. It seems that polio is entering in a particular population at this point in time. It will not stay confined to that population. Public health officials are haunted by images of patients crippled by paralytic polio. The U.S. hasn't seen it for almost a decade. But a recent case in Rockland County and almost 60 positive wastewater tests for the polio virus in New York City, including positive hits in three other counties right across the Hudson, recently prompted Governor Hochul to declare a state of emergency and promote polio vaccinations. That raised red flags here in New Jersey, says Rutgers Dean Perry Halkidis. Am I concerned that they, someone may become infected? Yes. So I think what New York has done with do, uh, creating a state of emergency for polio so that empowers people to be able to vaccinate and give boosters is something we should probably think about in New Jersey because we are basically one people across this area. On its website, Jersey's Department of Health posted, the presence of circulating polio virus in New York State poses a real threat to New Jersey residents. But so far, the virus has not turned up here. But they are looking for it. The CDC's National Wastewater Surveillance System recently checked for polio virus signals in 32 wastewater samples taken from May through August at five New Jersey sites in Essex, Hudson, Middlesex, Passaic, and Union counties, and reported 
reports all tested negative for polio. Samples from Bergen County taken separately since March also tested negative, says Columbia University researcher Kartik Chandran. The Little Fairy treatment plant covers about 50 percent of uh, Bergen County. So I think the, it corresponds to about 500,000 uh, individuals uh, across multiple towns, and we didn't find any signal for either poliovirus or monkeypox, which is a which is a good thing. Wastewater testing, what we have been seeing over the past two years, is it plays a vital role in our ability to plan for whatever the next public health problem is going to be, particularly around infectious diseases. We've seen it for COVID, we're seeing it for polio, and I think that we need to really invest more into that technology. Montclair epidemiologist Stephanie Silvera would like to see New Jersey expand wastewater testing, and Jersey's Department of Health says it is working with the CDC to enroll additional wastewater test sites. But she's also concerned about vaccinations. Even though New Jersey posts a strong childhood polio vaccination rate of 97.7 percent statewide, almost 20 points higher than New York's. But we know that there are communities that are similar to those in Rockland County in New Jersey, where we have seen outbreaks of things like measles because of their low vaccination rates. Measles outbreaks three years ago in Lakewood, Ocean County, mirrored similar outbreaks in Rockland County's ultra-Orthodox communities, and there's a deep cultural connection between the towns. But while Rockland's polio vaccination rate's only 60%, Ocean County reports a significantly more robust rate of 95%. Regardless, Silvera says local authorities still need to push polio immunization. We do have high vaccination rates overall, but there are some communities that do not. And so we need to reach out to those communities and do targeted interventions to increase those vaccination rates because we are talking about children who can become severely injured from this virus. Researchers believe the Rockland polio case is genetically linked to polio strains found in London and in Israel, and wastewater samples can rapidly reflect new viruses picked up abroad. It's not a static situation. Families went went on vacation and they all came back now, so the signature is going to look slightly different during the first couple of days of September, at least, at the very least. Uh, and then it may it may change again. This isn't about scaring people. This is about making people aware of the situation so that they can respond appropriately. Silvera says it makes vaccinations even more important. I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. The U.S. Justice Department has charged three Iranian nationals in a wide-ranging hacking scheme targeting the computers of local governments, public utilities, and nonprofits in the United States, including a domestic violence shelter in Union County and an accounting firm in Morris County. According to an indictment unsealed in New Jersey, the men remain at large in Iran and are charged with conspiracy to commit fraud, intentional damage to computers, and transmitting demands. In some cases, the hackers demanded hundreds of thousands of dollars in ransom payments in Bitcoin to unlock the malware on the computers. They also targeted victims in Israel, Britain, and Russia. The indictment doesn't accuse the men of carrying out the cyber attacks on behalf of the Iranian government, but they are accused of working for IT firms affiliated with the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. It's a major military, political and economic force in Iran. With the success of drug recovery courts now fully understood, law enforcement leaders are searching for meaningful responses for defendants with mental illness. Atlantic County Prosecutor William Reynolds is on a statewide crusade to bring about the first mental health court in New Jersey. It would screen and assess adults and minors with mental illnesses involved in the criminal justice system, offering treatment and support when appropriate, rather than time behind bars. New York, Pennsylvania, and Delaware have already launched such courts. New Jersey could be next. Atlanta County Prosecutor Will Reynolds is with me now. So it's been a little over a month since you were officially sworn in to the job. What have you seen during that time that led you to feel the mental health courts would be a good fit here? My background, which really lends itself to understanding this issue, is I was a municipal prosecutor in many municipalities in Atlanta County for 10 years prior to taking on this role. Uh, With that experience and that background, 
I was uh, literally on the forefront of dealing with the general public, victims, witnesses, defendants, police officers, court administration, judges. There was no buffer between myself and the public. I dealt with everyone on a daily basis. I would see between 500 and 1,000 defendants uh, per week. Uh, while I was a municipal prosecutor. And then when I became a county, the county prosecutor, one of the things that transpired was I interviewed every single assistant prosecutor in this office, as well met with all of the chiefs of police from Atlanta County. And it was overwhelming that there was a need for this based upon my own experience, as well as our frontline prosecutors, as well as the first responders that were dealing with the general public when we were called out for service. I mean, essentially, this would offer folks who are struggling um, with with some type of, of mental health issue treatment rather than imprisonment, yeah? That is correct. So really, the, the thought process would be modeled after recovery court. So New Jersey was very progressive in establishing a recovery court to give the ability for people who are suffering from addiction an opportunity to get themselves better clean up their lives and have all of their criminal cases eventually dismissed and expunged. Recovery court became a five-year process. Using that as the model, and there's some limitations to recovery court, and that's why mental health is so significant because it's a blind spot in the criminal justice system. It's very easy to get somebody placed into recovery and get them a bed. It's very difficult to get someone a bed who has mental health issues only. A lot of those uh, individuals have a dual diagnosis Recovery court has limitations. If there's no uh, addiction issues, you can't get them into a, uh, a mental health facility. Right. And in addition to that, if they only have mental health, you can't get them into uh, recovery court. So there, it's a blind spot and there's a need, clearly. Do you have some support from legislators? Because it, it seems anyway that it would take um, some legislation to get this done. Is there the will there from the state level too? Uh, not only is there the will from the state level, there's also the will from the national level. Uh, I'm very fortunate. Uh, I'm an independent, and I've remained independent my entire uh, legal career, which is just going on about 25 years. I have relationships on both sides of the aisle, both Republican and Democrat. Uh, you're 100% correct. It's going to require legislation. Uh, the AOC, uh, which is the administrative office of the courts, will be directed by the legislature to do this if it actually passes through. Uh, I can tell you the local legislatures here in Atlanta County, which is Legislative District 2, uh, Senator Palestina, Assemblyman Guardiman, and uh, Assemblywoman Swift are all on board to support this. And our legislatures, our, our legislators are looking at California. Yeah. So both California and Florida were able, were able to do this. So New Jersey is now on the precipice of, of uh, getting this together and uh, Fortunately for me, I have relationships on both sides, the Republicans and Democrats, and they're, they're listening. California, of course, right, being the most recent and some good models there uh, for New Jersey to look at. Atlantic County Prosecutor Will Reynolds, thanks for your time tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity and, and making the public aware of this issue. I think it's, it's definitely needed. Thank you. Well, summer's behind us, so how's the labor market looking? Rhonda Schaffler has the latest jobs report plus tonight's top business stories. Hey, Rhonda. Brianna, we're focused on Jersey jobs today as new numbers show employers in the state continue to hire. In August, 15,400 new positions were added to the economy, marking 21 straight months of job growth in New Jersey. And the estimates from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics show job growth in July was even stronger than first reported. New Jersey's unemployment rate has increased slightly to 4%. Companies would like to hire even more workers, but are struggling to find qualified applicants. The labor shortage was the subject of a New Jersey State Chamber of Commerce event this week. Chamber President Tom Bracken, a member of the NJPBS Board of Trustees, says this has been the toughest issue for New Jersey companies. This has kind of taken over as the number one issue facing business. So that doesn't sound like it's really easing that much because it continues to rank number one. Inflation uh, has been number one, it's now uh, number two, but those are the two top things facing business. But uh, 
This issue doesn't seem to be slowing down at all. According to a study from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, several factors led to the labor shortage, including enhanced assistance benefits that allowed workers to stay home, early retirements, and a lack of access to child care. In an effort to support the child care industry in the state, New Jersey is providing grants to care providers so they can make improvements to their centers. The New Jersey Economic Development Authority hosted an information session on the grants today. Another one will be held on Monday. Eligible licensed child care centers can apply for grants of up to $200,000. A few local retailers are holding job fairs this week. ShopRite holding in-person job fairs at some of its stores this Saturday. You can find locations on its website. And a new company in the Menlo Park Mall wants to hire 150 workers. True Food Kitchen is holding in-person job fairs for the rest of this month. Finally, the state treasurer's office says revenue collections from major taxes increased in August. Total revenue collections are up close to 18 percent compared to the same period a year ago. Now here's a look at Wall Street trading from today. I'm Rhonda Schaffler and those are your top business stories. And be sure to join Rhonda for the season premiere of NJ Business Beat. Rhonda kicks off the season with a look at the state of education in New Jersey, from the teacher shortage to financing college education. You can catch it Saturday morning at 10 a.m. on the NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel. As state leaders work to improve aging water infrastructure in many of New Jersey's older cities, an event with federal leaders recently touted the big strides made in Camden, where before the Clean Water Act some 50 years ago, factories in and around the city dumped chemicals, sewage and runoff into bodies of water with little to no regulation stopping it. As Raven Santana reports today, it's a much different story. In 1972, when the Clean Water Act was passed, we used to treat our water bodies, our rivers, creeks, and streams, as trash bins. Rivers flowed different colors, they caught fire, and they were treated like garbage cans. From tragedy to triumph. Over $300 million has been spent in this area by New Jersey and by Camden. And we're looking forward to another $150 million being spent in the future on projects like this to help continue to clean up our waters. EPA Deputy Assistant Director Bruno Piggott giving me a history lesson on how the Clean Water Act has helped to transform some of the state's biggest dumping grounds into a beautiful, clean and safe infrastructure. Today, the Cooper River is a Category 1 waterway, which means it's the cleanest it can be based on environmental standards by the state. Local utilities like the Camden County Municipal Utilities Authorities are collecting and treating that wastewater and ensuring it meets our tough standards. Piggott's comments were echoed at an event to celebrate the Clean Water Act's 50th anniversary. Camden was the second stop on a 10-stop tour highlighting success stories from the last five decades. The Clean Water Act has helped transport waterways in post-industrial cities like ours into places for recreation where our residents are now able to, as I mentioned, exercise, fish, and enjoy nature. Day by day, you don't see the change. But if you look back over five years, 10 years, or 50 years, you see the impact, you see that dramatic change that occurs. And that is the Clean Water Act. An impact that advocates say can greatly be felt by residents. We were able to host a paddle party in July of this year. Paddle party is getting folks, families in kayaks with supervision able to actually get on the water and see, get a different perspective of the neighborhood and taking advantage of what's here, the playground, fishing. Even as the EPA uses Camden as one of the many examples of the Clean Water Act success, advocates and supporters admit there is still work that needs to be done. Because as much as we should be proud and give ourselves and one another a pat on the back for the good work of the last 50 years, it hasn't been enough. A healthy economy or a healthy environment. That choice has, has always been and is still today false. 
And anyone who tells you that garbage is wrong. Another challenge is that Camden has what's known as a combined sewer system, meaning sewage and storm water combine in one pipe on its way to the water treatment plant. If it exceeds capacity, it can spill out into lakes and waterways. Piggott says it's a challenge that won't be fixed overnight, but is being worked on. Plans like this often take 20 years to implement fully because they're expensive and because there's so much work that has to be done throughout the system. And that's the kind of timeline that we're on. Now, this isn't, Camden hasn't just started. They've been involved in making progress for years. While the process to keep our waterways clean can seem long, it's important to remember that it's a process that's never too late to start. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Raven Santana. And before we leave you tonight, if you missed any of the big political headlines this week, tune in to Reporters Roundtable with senior political correspondent David Cruz. It's back. This week, Health Commissioner Judy Persichelli on the leadership vacancies at the agency and other challenges the health department is facing as the state continues recovering from the pandemic. Then a panel of journalists break down all the top headlines making news in New Jersey and the nation. You can watch the live stream of Reporters Roundtable Friday at 10 a.m. on our NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel, Twitter, or Facebook, or on NJPBS Saturday at 6 p.m. and Sunday morning at 10 a.m. That's going to do it for us this evening. I'm Brianna Venozzi. For the entire NJ Spotlight News team, thanks for being with us tonight. We'll see you back here tomorrow. The members of the New Jersey Education Association making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey.